All righty, good morning, guys. We are live again. This Tuesday morning, beautiful Tuesday morning, about 9.31 a.m., September 4th, 2018. Morning. Come join me as we start another devotion this morning. We're going to look at another hymn. This song um, dates way back to 1873. And somehow it turned into a Sunday school song. Hi, Olita. Olita May. Morning, CJ. Hi, Geneva. All right, let's get, and get started because I got a lot of... Um, information here I want to cover but we're going to look at um, the church hymn dare to be a Daniel and as I was praying about this um, devotion I actually had come across the song which I remember the song I don't think we've ever sang this song but um, I remember in passing in throughout the years hearing this song dare to be a Daniel um, as we was looking at our um, devotion yesterday I kind of stumbled on this song and kind of got to reading the lyrics of the song and of course I've remembered the chorus of it but um, and found it very interesting started praying about this and 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 thought you know what this is a very challenging um, song and this morning I hope this is a very challenging de um, devotion for each and every one of us um, to dare to be a Daniel. We're going to look at some scripture and, and kind of dig into what that means, you know, to dare, you know, to be a to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone if we have to for the cause of Christ. Um, and and for the purpose of God. Um, Daniel, we're only going to read one verse in Daniel, that's chapter one, verse eighteen. And I encourage you after this devotion to go back and read this chapter. But Daniel 1, 18 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the, of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. <clears throat> Look in Psalms chapter 17 verse 3. It says, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. This is a writing from King David. And what we're looking at this morning in a challenge for you and me, you know, myself included, that we need to be like Daniel. Now, I want to give you a little background on Daniel. And, and actually, um, the three Hebrew boys that we'll read about later on um, in another devotion um, in chapter 3 of Daniel, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, we'll find out. But Daniel and, and, and these three boys, among other young men, were taken captive from Judah from, and, and, and sent to um, Babylon, which the king was King Nebuchadnezzar. And they had taken some adults as well, but their purpose was to take these young men that were raised to worship and to serve God. And... Nebuchadnezzar wanted to take them and change them completely and pretty much brainwash them to reject the, the God of, of all living and to worship the false idols and gods that they had worshipped. And, you know, we, we're looking at the song, Dare to Be a Daniel, and the history of this, you know, the song was written by Philip Bliss, but we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to look at the, the history and the story behind Daniel. 
and we we can read that this story had taken place <clears throat> in the book of Daniel has taken place almost 2600 years ago think about that 2600 years ago we can find the history of Daniel we can find the history of where these young men were kidnapped and and tried to be brainwashed and forced to reject the living God and to worship false gods. Isn't it funny that 2,600 years later in our society today we're still fighting against worshiping the true living God and being brainwashed and worshiping other gods, false gods, false idols. And, you know, it tells me that, you know, the scripture, even though, you know, it's 2,600 years ago when this happened with Daniel, you know, it still applies today. And it shows me that God's word is never outdated. I read something a few days ago when I was doing a study and, and it said, you know, we need to revisit the Bible because there are many scriptures that's just outdated. There are many scriptures, you know, of the word of God that doesn't apply anymore. And I thought to myself, you know what? The sad thing is, it's not because God has changed, but it's because man has changed. We are so far away from God and His will this day and age. Society as a whole speaking, you know, are so far away from God that we feel like, oh, you know what? God's Word doesn't apply anymore. God's commandment doesn't apply because it's not because God's changed. It's not because God's Word is no more effect. It's because people's heart has changed. You know, God's Word is still true, and God's Word is still relevant today. When we read the Word of God, and we look at that, and we think, oh, I don't know if we should measure up to God's Word because times has changed. No, 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 no. It's people's hearts has changed. They're falling away from God. They're falling away. They're falling out of love with God is what's going on. But Daniel and, and, and the Hebrew boys, let's just say because it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and actually um, the Hebrew boys had, their actual name was Hananiah, um, Mishael, and Azariah. And we'll cover that in a minute. But anyway, so these, this story focused actually on these four young men. But just to give you a brief summary, it says the Israelites, the young boys and some adults, were um, captives in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar and they were to be taught the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans the main object objective was to make them Babylonians in other words because if you ever read and study about the Babylonians it was a picture just like Egypt uh, in the Bible time it was a picture of the world but anyway, so their main objective was to take these young men out of their God-fearing homes and change their hearts and change their way of thinking and reject the living God and worship the false gods. Boy, isn't that familiar today. Oh, you don't have to send your kids to church every week. Oh, you don't have to teach them Bible. You don't have to teach them commandments. This is what's being said today. Oh, you know what? You hear something about God and, and, and it's just crammed down my throat. I, I don't want to hear the Word of God. I hate when people cram the Word of God down my throat. Listen, cram the Word of God down my throat. Hopefully it will penetrate my heart. We need the Word of God. We need it, the Word of God beat in our head sometimes because our head is so thick and hard-headed that sometimes we, we need the Word of God beating in us. Shame on you Christians to say, oh, I don't want to, to, to push my um, salvation on somebody. Shame on you. Because I'll tell you now, the world don't care to push their immortality on you all. The, the world don't care to, to you know, have... Well, I, let's, let's just move on. It drives me crazy. But we, as Christians, we do have an obligation. We do have an obligation. I think many times people says, oh, I don't want to, to push my religion on somebody. I don't want to put... Listen, if it's your own religion, if it's your own thoughts, if it's your own ideas, yes, keep it to yourself. But if it's the Word of God that you find in the King James Version, the Word of God, then we need to shout it on the rooftops. And if it makes somebody mad, then shout a little louder. Because, listen, we only get one shot at this. 
If we leave this world without Jesus Christ in our hearts, then the Bible teaches us that we are going to be doomed. And I do not want to stand before God and answer and say, God, no, I didn't witness to that person because I didn't want to offend them. I didn't want to witness God because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. I didn't want to make them think about the way they're living. I would much rather face an angry mob than I would face an angry God. And I'm telling you this stuff because I love you. Listen, I'm not a, above sin. I'm not above making mistakes. I need the Word of God and I need His commandments and His mercy and His grace just like everybody else. And I thank God that people over in New Boston Christian Holiness Church taught me as a young boy to, to follow God and to stand, even if I had to stand alone, stand upon the Word of God. So, you know, society today, you know, instead of raising our children and our young people in the grace of God and His knowledge of the, of the Lord, which you can find in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, you know, the world wants to change the objectives. Um, they want to allow our young people to be conformed to this world and lose sight of the will of God. Isn't that so true? They want people, you know, let, let your young people go out and experience the world, they say. Oh, listen, the devil would love nothing more than for us to cut ties with our young people and let them go do. And sadly, it's happening. When's the last time you checked your child's phone to see what they were viewing? their Instagram, their Snapchats, their Facebook pages, and see their messengers, and see what they're looking at. My boy's almost 18 years old, and I've got his passwords to about everything. Oh, you're, you're too nosy. you got to let them grow up. Listen, like I told my boy a long time ago, there's nobody in this world going to love you more than your mommy and your daddy. Nobody. Nobody's going to care for you as much as your mom and your dad. And you may feel like they were overbearing and overprotective, but one day you'll look back and you'll thank, thank us for that. Yes, I believe we need to let them grow up. You know, and we understand that they're going to make mistakes. But there's nowhere in the Bible where it says at a certain age we should, you know, until they're old enough to move out on their own, should we cut ties and just let them do whatever and never pray for them, never teach them the right way. I hope and pray that you know, we've instilled something in our child and I hope and pray that God, because we dedicated both of our children to God a week after they were born, actually before they were born, but we had a little ceremony after they were born. Lord, you gave, us to them, gave this child to us and now let us give this child back to you and help us to raise this child, teach these children the way they should go. That's our responsibility. Are they my friends? Absolutely. I don't have any better friends than my wife and my two boys. Don't ever say, oh, you shouldn't be friends with your children. Listen, that's garbage. Be your friend. Be friends. But be a parent, too. Be a parent. Sometimes it's not going to be popular, and if I have to choose to be a parent or a friend, I'll always choose to be a parent first. But I want to be friends with my children. I want them to look at me not only as a dad, but as a friend that they can come and talk to and confide in without being judgmental and harsh, but giving them godly advice. But listen, Daniel had purposed in his heart, and you know the story, so I'm not going to cover all of it, but just in a little nutshell, um, the king said, listen, we've got meat and we've got the wine that we're going to give you all, and the menu was just plenty. And a lot of them had given in. Because there was temptation and, and uh, the, you know, the food was appealing. But, you know, if you study in Jewish history, there's a lot of food that they didn't believe in eating, like pork and, and different things like that. And no doubt the king had offered everything that they wasn't allowed to have. Isn't that the way the devil works? He seem, it seems like Satan will offer you everything that you know as a Christian you're not allowed to have. Oh, but I'm tempted. I, I want it. It's appealing to me. 
It might be good for a while, but then, you know, the, what does the Bible say? There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but those ways are the ways of death. There's things that looks good and looks appealing. Go all the way back to in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And the way the, way the serpent had tempted Eve first. And she said, well, God told me not to touch of that. She knew. And, God, and, and, Satan, and the serpent or Satan said, you know what? God knows that if you ate this, that your eyes would be open. And you'd be as a God. And you would see right from wrong. And that was true. But there was death behind that. And then she gave to Adam, and Adam had the same commandment not to touch of that forbidden fruit. And people always say, well, if, um, if it was forbidden, why God put it in the garden anyway, in the first place? Because God gives us free will. God gives us a choice. God says, listen, don't touch this, but if you do touch it, this is what's going to happen. He gave you a choice. He gives us a choice today. You serve Jesus Christ, you accept Him as your Savior, but you don't have to, but if you do not, sin can't enter into heaven, and there's, there's only one place, one thing that you, other place that you can go other than heaven, and that's the devil's hell. He doesn't force us to serve Him, but there are um, penalties if we reject and neglect. So, Anyway, so they, King Nebuchadnezzar commanded they eat the meat, they drink the wine, and Daniel found favor, favor in the eunuch, the chief eunuch, the chief guard. And he told the guards, listen, I don't want to eat this. I don't want to defile myself. I will not. And the guard said, but you've got to because if the king comes back and, and sees that you're more puny, you're weak and you're frail from not eating, he knows that, you know, He's going to have my head. And Daniel said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Let's have an eating contest. He said, you give me the pulse, which was vegetables. You give me water, and in ten days, you compare me with the others that's eating the meat. And we'll see what happens. And so that's what exactly what had happened. Be right back. Come on in, man. And so after the ten days was over with, then we found out that Daniel did fare better in the appearance and his countenance than all the other men. And so for the rest of that duration, Daniel purposed and said, I'm not going to defile myself. Wouldn't that be wonderful that you and I as Christians would purpose in our heart that we're not going to defile our bodies. We're not going to defile our minds. We're not going to defile ourselves with the worldly things. Now listen, I know people get extreme. I had somebody tell me that it was a sin that we went to the beach. You know, it, that's foolishness. Mm -hmm. Foolishness. God never saved us so we can and, and expects us to sit in our living room twirling our thumbs until He comes back to get us. We can enjoy things in this world. It's the sinful things that we need to abstain from. But anyway... So he's teaching us here to dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be just like him. You know, purpose in our heart that we're not going to do anything to defile God or ourselves. I found this interesting, and we won't go into great detail, and then I'm going to wrap this up. But anyway, <clears throat> we look at Daniel, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. One of the first things they done when they kidnapped these boys, among the others, is they removed them from their godly home and brought them into the king's palace. And a lot of these people, young men that were taken were amazed at the king's luxury, at the king's palace. And even though they was taken away from their home, they looked around and thought, hey, you know, this is the life. You know, look at all the things that the king is offering us. But listen, I want you to know that's the way the devil plays with us. He can remove you from one place and put you somewhere that you might think is better. But it's only for a season. It's only temporary. The Bible teaches us that there's only pleasure in sin for a season. There's joy in sinful things. There is. Don't you ever say, oh, I never found pleasure in anything in sin. Sure you have. Sure you have. There is pleasure in sin for a season. 
And there's things that I would still do if I didn't, if I knew it wasn't wrong because I enjoyed it. But God's called me out of many things because there's sin in it. Not because I didn't enjoy it, but I knew that that sin would lead to death. Not just death of my body, but death of my soul. Eternal death. And I knew that God called me out of that. So listen, the devil will offer you things that makes you look good. It makes you feel good. And there's pleasure in that for a while. But then it's over. And then you'll, find, you'll face a judgment day. Another thing that they did to these young men is they changed their names. Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. Hannah and Michelle and Azariah was changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you notice that Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, and Azariah, their names had something to do with the living God. But then the king changed their names or had their names changed to their false gods. And each name meant represented a false idol or a false god. So, you know, again, they changed their location. They changed their name. All what they was trying to do was brainwash them to worship in false idols and false gods and to forget and reject the living God. But aren't you thankful that they purposed in their heart? If you go into chapter 3 of Daniel, you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar had a statue erected and every time the music stopped or started playing, everybody had to stop and worship. And the Hebrew boy said, let it be known. We're not going to worship. Even if you kill us, let it be known that we did not worship your false God. That takes a lot of bravery. That takes a lot of faith. That takes a lot of courage. And God will provide every, everything that we need to overcome the temptations of this world. But we've got to dare to be a Daniel. We've got to dare Eve sometimes to stand alone. When the whole class or when the whole workforce or wherever you're at, you're, all your friends are doing something that you know is wrong, dare to be a Daniel. Even if you have to stand alone, purpose in your heart that you're not going to defile yourself or God with the worldly things. <clears throat> this song, Dare to Be a Daniel, was written back in um, 1873. Just a few years before um, Philip Bliss's death. Um, Philip Bliss had, we covered him in the past. He was the writer of the song Almost Persuaded that we covered a few months ago. But he died in 1876 at the age of 38. So in 1873 is when he wrote this song. Hey, he died in a train crash. And actually he survived the train crash. Um, but the train caught fire and his wife was pinned under something and he died in the fire trying to rescue her and they both perished. But it says this hymn was written just three years um, before his death. Now let me find my page here. Okay. <clears throat> and we're going to look at the, um, the three, there's four verses to this song. In verse one it says, Standing by a purpose true, heading God's command. Honor them, the faithful few. All hail to Daniel's band. Verse 2, many mighty men are lost. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band? Verse 3, many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, Headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Verse 4 says, Hold the gospel banner high unto victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. And then the chorus of this song is, Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Think about that. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. And dare to make it known. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Don't be afraid of witnessing for Jesus Christ. I understand there's times that you're not able to open your mouth to speak to somebody. Maybe that opportunity doesn't present itself. 
but you can always be a witness. I love that Facebook um, picture that somebody shared with me a few years back. It says, always preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. Listen, we can be a light and a witness to people by the, our actions, by our attitudes, by the smile on our face. Without saying a word, we can show people that Christ is in us. And when necessary, then use words to help them. I want to give you two more verses of Scripture, and then we're going to um, wrap this up. In, first, in, in James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So, you know, Daniel never said, listen, God, why did you tempt me? You let me be kidnapped. You let me be taken into a, 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 the king's palace that I shouldn't be in. You let them add, you know, food to me, to the food that I'm not allowed to eat. You know, you let them present that to me. God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen? God, why are you tempting me? Does that sound familiar? Today in our society, things happen and we blame God for everything. Unless something good happens, then we say we're lucky. When something bad happens in your life, when you find yourself in a situation, instead of going to God and saying, God, why did you put drugs in my, uh, my face? Why did you put alcohol to tempt me? Why did you put porn in front of me? Why did you um, put this woman or this man in front of me? Why did you make my heart lust? Instead of blaming God for things, we need to stop and say, God, where am I at? Where's my heart? Where's my focus? Where is my purpose? Ooh, that's not popular preaching, is it? Listen, God will never tempt us with evil. He will never take something evil and dangle it in front of our face and see if He can grab it. That's not what God does. Now we read in, in, uh, in Genesis when God tempted Abraham, and that word tempted meant test. God tested Abraham. You know the story where he sacrificed his son, but God stopped him. God will not tempt us with evil. If we are tempted, it's because we're drawn away with our own lust and our own entice. So think about that. If I'm tempted of something, it's not because God put it there to tempt me. It's because I've got lust or desire or I'm enticed for it. And those things, listen, that's not the sin you know, some things are you're tempted by. That's not the sin. The sin is when you accept it, when you bite, you know. But when you feel like you're tempted by something that you know you shouldn't do or have or watch or listen to or drink or eat or watch smoke or whatever, then go to God and say, God, I'm tempted. Help me to rise above that. And listen, I can give you a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, things that are tempting you you're not new to that that's not you're not the only one that's ever been tempted that's stuff that's common to men but god is faithful who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that you are able but will with tempted with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it and I know people says, oh, God won't put things on me that I can't bear. God won't tempt me more than I can bear. Listen, it's not God that's tempting us with evil. It's our entice. It's our desires. It's our lust in our heart that's tempting us. I'm going to tell you now, there's never been one time, I'm almost 43 years old. At the middle of this month, I'll be 43 years old. And not one time in my life have I ever been tempted to sit down and eat oysters or liver or chicken gizzards never one time have i sat and thought mm, i wonder what that would look like or taste like i've never been tempted of it i looked at it and i thought oh my gosh that a gag of maggot i don't know how people can eat that i've never been tempted of it but you know what you know i've been on this health kick and trying to lose weight and all that and i am tempted when we bring cookies home i'm tempted when we bring little Debbie snack cakes home, I'm tempted. 
and I know I can't have that because it's going to be good. What's that old um, saying? A moment on the lips is um, forever on the hips. <laughs> and listen, it might be good while you're eating it. It might be good while we're partaking of it. But the after effects of it is what we're going to have to deal with. And folks, sin is the same way. It might be good while you're partaking in it. But it's the aftermath, it's the after effects of sin that's going to destroy us. But God teaches us that with the temptation, that He gave us a way to escape, that we may be able to bear it. I say hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? Today I want to challenge you. Dare to be a Daniel, whether it's popular or not. Purpose in your heart that you're going to serve God. Purpose in your heart that you're not going to defile yourself with the worldly things. You're not going to defile God with worldly things. That when you're tempted, that you go to God and say, God, I'm tempted of these things. Give me grace. Give me strength to, to overcome this. And God will give you just what you need. Listen, dare to be a Daniel today. Thank you for watching. Share this video. Have a wonderful day. Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow with another devotion. Love you guys. God bless you.